Thanks everyone for joining us on Vajo's Cultural Safety Podcast. So today we're going to be discussing cultural safety and intersectionality. Uh, the first episode we had a yarn with Aunty Jill Gallagher about what cultural safety was and in the second episode we spoke with Cherie Lowe about social and emotional wellbeing. But today we want to focus on how intersectionality impacts cultural safety. We're really fortunate to have... Uh, everyone with us today to share their lived personal and lived experiences with us around cultural safety and how it plays out for intersectional mob. I thought we'd kick things off um, first with a bit of an icebreaker, then we can do introductions. So, who would like to start us off? A 60-second coming out story. I can go. Um, I grew up with my parents. They were split up most of my life and my father, he was not the nicest guy. He's non-Aboriginal and... He was homophobic as well. So I grew up kind of taking on a few of those prejudices in myself. But thanks to my mum, who was just the best person ever, I unlearned them really young. And so when I was 14, I came out as bisexual, yep. as bi at first, because to me that felt more palatable for people to take in, that I liked both men and women. But it only took me to 15 to say, no, I'm, I'm gay. And when I told my mum, I was crying. And she just basically laughed in my face and told me to go away because she did not care. <laughs> she was just like, I do not care. I Why don't are care. you crying? Stop doing that thing with your face. Wow. Get out of here. <laughs> she's like, she just no cares at all. She's the biggest support ever. And she's just excellent. I love her. And um, when I came out as non-binary, which was when I was 18, um, she took that really well as well. She accepted me fully she still struggles getting my pronouns correct but as i i don't have any content for that as it's just a genuine mistake just yep. habit but yeah she's the best person that i could have behind my back mine's not necessarily fun but it's just um being raised in um being raised in a family with really strong family and cultural values yep um so i was always empowered to just be me anyway yeah, um, yeah. And like I've said, um, you can't really... Uh, it's not two different things, my sexuality and my cultural identity. So because I was so empowered with my Torres Strait and South Sea Islander culture, it informs that um, queer identity as well. So for me, it was um, just a conversation with mum a couple of years ago. I think most of my family have just always known and I've never really felt pressure because I'm just kind of living my own life. Yeah, yeah. And I don't... I don't have parameters on who needs to know and who doesn't. I'm just going to live my life, and if you're on that journey, then great. If you're yes. not, then you're not. Um, and it was just mum saying, um, oh, you know, we were in the car. I think we were on the way to Woolies or whatever. And she was like, oh, I was going to come over. And I'm like, no, I'm having dinner with uh, so-and-so. And I'm like, oh, who's that? And I'm like, oh, my pa- then partner at the time. Um, and, yeah, that was that. And she's that like, was that. Oh, oh. So, and then it went to, oh, so I'm not going to get grandkids. Oh, God. And I'm like, uh, well, I hate kids anyway. Yes. And I can still have them if I decide to change my mind, which isn't yes. likely. Why is there always an <laughs> assumption that we won't have kids? Well, some of us yeah. some of us also can't, unfortunately, have them, you know. Yeah. But there's always a mini- – oh, no children. Yeah. Well, no, actually. <laughs> but I love that you're absolutely like, okay, I'm just going to be on this journey and you can either join or not. I really don't mind. Goodbye. And we know that cultural safety is important to everyone. It's everybody's business. And it really is about uh, being able to freely express your own identity and your own culture, uh, including your own gender identity as well, or even your own religion with, without any challenge or denial. Um, so let's talk about how that definition of cultural safety or the definition of cultural safety sits with each of you and what cultural safety means to you, particularly from an intersectional space being Aboriginal the Torres Strait Islanders mob, as well as queer? For me, cultural safety is a, the English interpretation of our understanding of our law. So our law gives us place. It identifies for us how we connect to one another and how we respect one another and each other's differences. So for me, cultural safety sits within the parameters of our understanding as Aboriginal people. It connects us to our cultural values um, and with that, of course, cultural safety in, in other areas is about recognising and celebrating difference um, with equity, of course, at the core. 
I think that with cultural safety, um, of course it's for everyone, but in relation to its connection to our mob, I think it's really about celebrating diversity and what makes us unique as Aboriginal um, people across the community is, uh, is our differences. So that's what cultural safety um, looks and feels like for me. Simplest form is just about respect. Um, being respectful yep. when I'm outwardly expressing um, my Torres Strait Islander cultural values in the workplace or even out. Um, that's, you know, it's, and that's as simple as I can put it. Yep. And that's why it's important to me. I agree with Harold on that, that basically cultural safety is about respect and if you're entering a space that is culturally safe, you can go into that environment and be met with yeah, no challenge, no denial, no prejudices, just based on how you wish to express yourself and express your culture. As an intersectional Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander human being, what does a culturally safe space that addresses your queer and racial identity, what does that look like to you? What would make it a safe space? What are some of the elements that would make you feel like this is a very safe space for me? I think part of that is truth-telling across a different organisation or a team or wherever you are, whether you be at a footy club or um, working in, a, in an ACO or working in government, wherever, I think a commitment to truth-telling and where different orgs are at in yep. terms of this conversation is really important. I think here in Victoria there's a lot um, happening very quickly in this space and it's great to see, but the, the challenge is, I think, ensuring that different organisations, different community groups aren't left behind in that yarn. So um, particularly that of our, our trans community, ensuring that no one gets left behind is really, really important. Um, and that all people feel valued and celebrated um, in yeah, different, different community-based settings. Um, for me, uh, a, a successful safe space for that type of scenario for me is, um, I can't think of a particular organisation, but I can think of um, just interpersonal relationships with other people mm -hmm. within the organisations. Yeah. People who respect boundaries, respect pronouns, respect that um, you can't really connect with me um, just as a Torres Strait Islander man, you have to understand that there's a large queer aspect to me that it all sort of meshes together and so much of my queer identity informs my cultural identity and vice versa. Oh, yes. So when you're having sort of wider discussions in an organisation, it's not one size fits all. That's right, yeah. Um, especially across genders um, and the way people self-identify. So I can't speak to that and I can't give an example, but I can just say that we can build those relationships and I've tried to do that successfully with my own family members. Yep. As we know, there's sort of the challenges there are cultural hierarchies, whereas you're a son, you're not necessarily a queer man, you're a, even a Torres Strait man, you're just a son. So you're right. stripped of certain parts of your identity in those relationships. So when you get to an organisation that tries to embrace those elements, um, it's almost like a journey and I can yeah. say in my current organisation over the past five years there's been a journey of being able to stand up and say this is who I am and then growing from that aspect and then taking it back to family and yep. helping them on that journey of creating that safe space but individually with my family members. Yep. And I think it just, yeah, and it's all kind of flows on um, with who I interact with, other organisations that I might reach out to, uh, those individuals who work in those orgs. Um, as well as my own team members and other colleagues. Harold, you mentioned an example of, of a culturally safe space being pronouns being respected. And I think that's a really good point because even though it's 2022, I feel like the pronoun conversation is still quite new. We're still hearing older language used around pronouns such as preferred pronouns, um, which we know is no longer really acceptable language because it's it's not they're the pronouns I prefer, it's they are my pronouns. So can we have, does anyone want to sort of maybe explain why using pronouns and respecting pronouns is so important and how that has, I suppose, played a, pl a part in reconciling your queer identity with your, for want of a better term, Aboriginality? To me, using the correct pronouns for someone, especially after you've been informed by them of their pronouns that they would like you to use, not doing so intentionally is 
malicious in my eyes. Yep. And little mistakes, like my mum still refers to me as she sometimes and I have no hatred for that. I have no content or if anyone mixes up my pronouns because that's just westernised standards that we've all been brought into and grown up in that visually I look like a woman. But, yeah, when it gets to that point where you're doing it intentionally or prefacing when someone tells you their pronouns oh I don't do any of that stuff I don't that stuff isn't me I hate that you tell you you introduce yourself to someone and they immediately preface your entire relationship with I'm not going to respect you yes just in the most basic form your gender doesn't matter to me yeah so when someone says I don't see your gender it's that's the equivalent of of I don't see color meaning that they are dismissing everything that comes along with say for example being socialized as a female but within you, trying to reconcile that that does not fit with who I am. Growing up, it impacted my relationship with my femininity because I just constantly rejected it and just wanted to completely rebel against a society that was telling me that in order for me to, ex- to succeed as a woman, I had to be a lady with a certain amount of manners that the men <laughs> didn't seem to have to also have so like and now I ident- I actually strongly identify as a gender it like when you were talking about your experience and people like sort of giving you advice or whatever I had this one experience going back to my high school reunion and like speaking about my relationship with school friends and everyone was like yeah I knew like I knew straight away like as soon as you came into boarding like this like you you were queer and I was like how did you know that before me like Mm. isn't it just so weird that the world is like sort of conditioned to like spot you out or or try and see you but then in reality it's like in just about every media campaign every television show every you know music again again that's changing but you're you're invisible but yes. everyone sort of like got you pinned before you understand yourself. I just thought that was an interesting sort of thing and I'm not sure if anyone else had that experience. I, just I thought definitely it was funny. have. I've been looked at <laughs> and I, I, I've been looked at and people have asked me, what's in your pants? What are you? Oh, my God. I, I've been people asked what's in no my pants shame. that many times. No shame. Nothing at all. Literally. I was like, you really have the audacity to just ask me that? <laughs> but what's in, what, what's in your pants? Yeah, what's in your – why do you care? How is that? Why do people think that that's an appropriate question to ask? It's like when people say, yeah, but how much Aboriginal are you? Why do you need me to quantify it for you? Am I going to... Am I in a race? Will I win a prize if I have more Aboriginality in me than than the person next door? But that's because I think that society places far too much importance on this is the label, this is the box that goes on. Now, everything that goes into that box must fit precisely... There is an absolute need to put that thing into a very clearly labelled box so they know exactly how to deal with it and how to respond to it. And that's what we find in cultural safety too, that people want hard and fast rules. But they don't realise that you're actually dealing with humans. And they're very unpredictable. So something that could be culturally unsafe for me may not necessarily be culturally unsafe for you, Jade, or even yourself, Howard, because gender does play a big part in what, is and isn't culturally safe for people. You know, we've also got that layer of men and women's business in our community um, that non-Aboriginal queer folk don't necessarily deal with, although in some other cultures there is that layer. Um, but it's not the Trauma Olympics. We're not saying that we're, we're doubly marginalised and so therefore we're worse off than anyone. In fact, all we're really saying is that there needs to be more visibility and more discussion around these these points because culturally safe spaces are very important for us all, but it's also important that they recognise and value the diversity and intersectionality that we bring to the table as unique individuals. Yeah, yeah I would agree with a lot of those points. Um, but again, pro- the use of pronouns, again, for me, goes back to just basic levels of respect. Absolutely. I think people are also missing one very um, significant point, which is using pronouns is also about normalising them for our trans and gender diverse siblings because if they are the only ones who are using pronouns and they still continue to be othered. But I also like the correlation in cultural safety 
regarding the identity for LGBTQI plus people and the, not the identity of Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Island, Islander people. And what I'm talking about there is in both circumstances, you have people who may not necessarily physically fit the stereotype of what we're meant to look like. So when people find out, you know, that you're, say, for example, Aboriginal but you're fair-skinned, oh, I didn't even know. I would never would have picked that. And it's the same conversation that I've overheard trans and gender diverse people have when they say what they're prone to. Oh, I didn't know that you were trans. I never, You know, it's that kind of... OK, so you, you've made an assumption of what that person sh- should look like and then when they've told you, the whole conversation turns into your comfort level about the surprise and shock that you never knew that and there surely should have been some way that you should have pegged it when in actual fact people will try and pass whether they are passing as a fair sk- like a fair skinned person passing for white or a trans and gender diverse person trying to pass for their the the gender that they're affirming um, they're passing because they want to feel safe and they're not safe mm. the world tells us that we're not safe the world tells us that we can we can expect to have to watch our trans and queer um, family uh, be killed at higher rates, be subjected to assault at higher rates and without any re- any kind of consequences. So f- the message that I get is that, yes, black lives matter, black queer lives, mm, we're still talking about it. Jury's out, we'll let you know. Race in... That within the queer community has always been a hot topic of, of conversation. We know that in, I think it was 2017, Philadelphia created the Philadelphia Pride flag where they actually added the brown and black stripes okay. for the purposes of being inclusive within the state of Philadelphia. And it started off a huge controversy that, um, well, where's, where's the white re- representation? Mm. But I believe that that's always there. It's always unspoken there, just like heteronormative relationships are always unspokenly the standard that we are all meant to, to, as, meant to as, aspire to, which is why we constantly see so much over-representation of straight relationships in media, on television shows, in Disney. Mm. Um, yeah. This is a, a, a huge conversation. It's yeah. quite a broad conversation. Australia has a long way to go um, in terms of being a... a non-racist space for any person of colour, just to be frank. Um, But I think also we're a lot better at accepting queerness if it's on the white man's terms. Absolutely, yes. And so we're we're very open to that. And I think that the the challenge with being a queer person of colour is that not only are you not represented, any sort of influence or any impact that your community has had in the broader narrative, isn't recognised. Instead, it's passed off as um, innovation from another community or, you know. So I think that that's a really um, interesting space. But as soon as we start to talk about people of colour, it suddenly becomes an issue about race, not a space of celebrating diversity. And I think that's the challenge that we're constantly aware of because that means then we have to dilute our experiences to fit within a Western construct, and we have that's to become unsafe. palatable. Yeah, yeah, and yes. it's and it's unsafe um, for so many in the in those areas. There's often a um, a rhetoric that goes around in community. I don't mind if you're gay as long as you don't throw it in my face. Yeah, um, <laughs> which I wasn't planning to, um, but now I kind of want to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, don't force, don't it, force on me. it on me. Don't I'll, force your I'll views use on your me. pronouns when I'm ready. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for existing. It's these so these are breaches to cultural safety that we're that we're really looking at. How about we switch the narrative and talk about the like really positive experiences that we've had where cultural safety for our queerness and our race has been elevated at the same time, or has been respected, for want of a better term, at the same time? I think the journey for me has probably happened in the last five years when I've joined my current organisation, because you're around and we have tend to employ people who have similar experiences yes. and sort of worldviews of kind of... And I've never had the opportunity to sit down with other people who have gone through those journeys who are, you know, black and queer and go, oh... 
I'm not the only one out there. Mm-hmm. And there's certain yes. light bulb moments that you because you feel isolated. Yep. Um, sort of just observing for a little while as well, for probably a year or two, mm-hmm. just to pick up on, oh, so these are the tools that I can use to articulate myself. And those are things you don't get taught. You get taught how to be black in white spaces, but not how to be queer in black spaces. Mm. So those are things that I can just learn of just sort of being around people in really positive spaces. So for me, I think that's probably one of the most positive ones. And then, like I said earlier, I use those experiences to sort of um, shape the way I speak to my family about some of the things I'm going through that they may not understand or um, certain aspects of personal relationships I have and, you know, you know, because for some reason there's an um, almost a belief that queer relationships are different to heterosexual relationships. <laughs> we go through the same things, we've got to pay the same yeah. kind of rent, but yes. <laughs> so it's not different. But you know, just um, getting them there is can be difficult. Mm-hmm. And I learned a lot of those positive things with just being around other mob. Was that also part of internalized homophobia? Do you think? I know um, I've experienced that where I've ex- I've just assumed that if I'm going to be moving from relationships with males to relationships with... I don't know um, why this is so awkward. No, I, I'm... I, f- I find that, like, um, I'm worried that, okay, well, now it's, it's going to be a bitchy relationship, there's just going to be gossip, there's going to be fighting all the time, cattiness. And then I went, actually, no, it's nothing like that. It's literally just like being with another human, yeah. except they also happen to, you know, we can... We can share clothes. <laughs> Double the wardrobe. Double the wardrobe. For it's me, like this relationship is wholesome. Yeah. For me, I, I didn't have those experiences. It was internalising other people's homophobia around me. Oh, yes. My own family members. Yes. Yeah. So I've never been concerned about my own homosexuality because I, because my family empowered me as a black man, as a Torres Strait and a South Sea Islander man. And this is where we talk about intersectionality. Because I've been empowered in those cultural aspects, that informs my queer identity. Yep. So I've always been proud. Um, in terms of sort of that internalised stuff, I've never... I've, I've always felt like you've got to make informed decisions about how safe a space is. Yes. Um, yes. Unfortunately. And those are s- sort of where I've done it. Um, and that's when, you know, the last five years have been sort of monumental for me that I don't need to do that. I can yeah. walk outwardly and I can say, well, this is who I am, this is how I identify. If you don't like it, you make the informed choice of that. that's not the kind of person I want to associate with for whatever yeah. reason. I don't really care because I'm not going to chase after anybody. But I can educate you if you want to. Um, yep. I won't be abused as a black Google but, or a queer one. Um, but I'm happy to go along with that journey with you if you feel there's a benefit mm. for in our relationship. Uh, you made a very good point there. And it's come up a couple of times about um, homophobia within Aboriginal communities. Um, and I think what a lot of people out there don't realise is that it's a direct result of colonisation and the in- introduction of forced religions. And to this day, it still plays out. I know that um, for myself, in 2017, when the country decided that, again, it would put a group of people through a public vote on their rights, just like in 1967 with the referendum, um, in 2017, everyone got to decide this time whether or not queer people could marry, marry each other. Um, And that public discussion, I don't know for the rest of you, but on social media, what I found was as a queer and Aboriginal person, all of the negative comments that I received were not only obviously very homophobic, but they were also racially motivated as well. Um, And I couldn't separate the two because, you know, you'd have people who were saying, well... No, even your own community don't agree and they just throw up um, an attachment of the Bark Petition, which was from the Northern Territory and not relevant to here in Vic. The homophobia that still exists very much today within our community and for some of us, our community can be a space where we don't even need to come out because no one cares. Mm. It's not relevant. Unless, of course, there is a religious influence Mm. and then it's very much within becomes a problem for us within our community. I think um, there's a couple of elements there. The, you know, there, um, I was raised with um, Seventh-day Adventist values, so obviously that comes with certain yeah. aspects of um, homophobia, which is um, interesting, but my, mo- my own personal experience with my own mother, 
um, is that we believe in these teachings. However, I have friends who are boys who wear dresses. Yep. So, my f- so it's one of them ones where you kind of make whether heterosexual people within our own families um, contextualize it where it's safe. So, um, my male friend who is a boy who wears dresses, and that's okay, because you know um, he's a, he's a lady. I, and I never really understood what that meant, but that was then forcing... I wouldn't be able to sort of be friends with this man who wears dresses yep. um, if he wasn't acting like a lady. And it's kind of weird that you're holding that kind of almost um, heteronormative sort of standard to queer people yeah, who don't fit in it. Absolutely. So it happens um, just in terms... Of, and even with people who would consider themselves allies, it was really, really interesting. Mm. Um, and... It's also frustratingly awkward is that those people can sit down and articulate why cultural safety is important for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in organisations and white spaces and completely fall apart about intersectional yes. <laughs> cultural safety. Absolutely. Um, which is odd to me because I think the standards are the exact same. I do too and I believe that it's really quite simple. Like you've said earlier, it really is just comes down to being, you know, it's respectful behaviour. But it's also, if we continue to compl- complicate the concept of cultural safety within itself, mm. then no one's ever going to grasp it. But I do believe that we do live in a country that has a very good talent for overcomplicating very simple concepts. And so then they become um, the unwanted concept or a leftist view or something like that. But respectful behaviour is what I can tell is something that is definitely on the agenda for Gen Z to be pushing and the world is changing. So using pronouns is becoming such so normalised um, that eventually I think the people who are adverse to it, for whatever reason, um, I think they'll find that they're going to find it very difficult to even start to be able to communicate with others because we're, I believe we're... Co- starting to get into a world that has started to say enough is enough, tolerance isn't good enough, acceptance is the goal, um, and it's time to move forward. In relation to truth-telling and our, our true history in this country, we haven't even got to the, the stage yet where we can speak openly and, and in, a, in a safe way about what's happened over the last 270 plus years in this country. So in relation to queer mob, which have always and will always be a part of our communities, um, I don't believe that we're quite yet there in terms of having either a, a, perhaps at a local level, yeah, but at a state and national level, we've got a long way to go. And a part of that is yeah. is being open to our mistakes and, and taking ownership of that yep. because um, that's how we learn. We don't learn when we uh, reflect on the good parts of our history. We reflect when we've been challenged so, um, or we grow when we've been challenged. So um, I think we've got a long way to go. Um, and I think broadly the non-Aboriginal community don't quite recognise how incredibly diverse our mob are. No, not absolutely only in, not. in experience, history, culture, law, country, um, but also in lived experience. Our mob have always been here. Um, and always will represent a large part of our community. The challenge is, is that because of colonisation, often we've been excluded from um, the conversation. And, and yeah, so, yeah, long way I to agree. go. I and agree. I think with Torres Strait Islander people as well, I mean, like, recent census data came out, we represent 3% of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So if you look at minorities within minorities within minorities, I mean... You've probably got what twenty percent of Torres Strait Islander mob sitting in this room with you. So Yeah, um, yeah. And yeah, the visibility so even the, there. Yeah, the visibility is, is really just, difficult. Yeah, well yeah, the the media have a good way of putting us all in the same category. Yes, within itself to yeah. cultural safety. Yeah, and what yeah. what like I think is often missed is that in this space, whether it be cultural safety, whatever, it's like this is our history. This isn't just Torres Strait Islander mm. people or you know, Kanji people or whoever else, this is our history. So long as we live, grow and become on Aboriginal land and Torres Strait Islander land, we have a responsibility to carry on this story um, and celebrate our connection to that story. It doesn't 
start when we start working in an ACO or when we go to NAIDOC, NAIDOC marches, it should be 365 days a year, no breaks in between. Yep. yep. And we know that some of our, our old people have some information, I guess, or, or historical, because, you know, our, our older people always hold on to those, those stories and that knowledge. And we know that historically there have been language terms and ways for queer mob within community. I mean, Tiwi Islands is a classic example of that. Brother, boys and sister girls have existed for a very, very, very long time. Like, we're all, like, all, always here, still here, still queer. <laughs> I, I agree with those points. Um, one of the things we haven't really touched on that I think sort of helps shape a lot of that conversation is that, you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people aren't homogenous and that the fact that we all have different political ideologies as well. Yes. Um, and we've touched on a little bit of religion and how that shapes how people view us, but we haven't touched on the way people's individual political views shape it. And one of the... Th I'm from North Queensland um, and from a part where the state member is a uh, One Nation representative um, and um. the uh, federal one is a n Liberal National in my hometown. And no one... And, and I guess in my own community, it's oftentimes no one works harder to uphold some of those sort of westernised systems and sort of, uh, I guess, what they consider normal heterosexual lives um, harder than a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in those communities because they either feel empowered by it or they don't see themselves as other. And I think there's a conversation there in certain parts of the country where I'm from, North Queensland, where you can be dark-skinned like myself but not feel like the other because you're heterosexual. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yep. So, and so then when there's conversations that are required a certain amount of elevation about queer people, um, there's almost sort of pushback against it because you're challenging something that doesn't need to be challenged for them. Yes, absolutely, yes. You're challenging something that everyone else has become so comfortable with, mm -hmm. so why do you have to stand now? You're making it uncomfortable for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I find that if you look at our, even our history, not only in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, but if you look in queer, co queer community history, all of those people who stood up, you know, because like you said, and all of the mob who have gotten up, stood up and showed up for queer mob and for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander mob were always targeted or pegged as troublemakers. So when you try and we know that with change comes an adversity to change and uncomfortability. I would say for anyone listening that if you find yourself in a situation, whether it's racial or something to do with queer mob and you're feeling very uncomfortable, I'd challenge you to sit with that uncomfortability and try and connect where that's coming from and why that's coming up for you and how maybe you might need to change it. Because often when that, that uncomfortability comes up, it's unconscious bias mm. that is being revealed to a person and they're not even aware. And we also haven't touched on our, our own experiences just as individuals, say, pre and post coming out. So, I mean, I'm, gonna, I'm happy to kick, kick it off and use myself as an example. I'm now 44, but I actually didn't come out until I was 37, so that was 2016. Um, and at the time, I remember being so confused that there had been this part of me that had been sort of in my face but at the same so time so deeply hidden because I've said to people I wasn't just in the closet, I was in Narnia. I was having tea with Mr Tumnus. It was lovely. <laughs> um, he's quite the decorator. Um, but... Because I, the denial was internalised. I'd convinced myself and I didn't realise, like you, Harold, I was also raised religiously, so I was raised born-again Christian and religion always told me that that's an abomination and is an absolute sin. Um, and so I found myself at the age of 37 going, what is happening here? Who am I? And then I had to investigate it because I had to understand it um, and I couldn't help but see the similarity between having the same feelings come up when I finally decided that I would um, let all my friends know that I'm Aboriginal. Because up until that point, no one had known when I was younger 
So when I started to tell them, it was very much the same kind of response. This is a phase. How do you know, though? Um, and wanting evidence. I don't know what evidence you want when a, when a person tells you they're queer. Um, that's a bit concerning. Mm. <laughs> but my experiences as an Aboriginal person who was straight were very di- have been very different. My experiences as a queer Aboriginal person and finding a space that will respect and value both has been a challenge, mm. really, without having to either educate people or create that space. And I think that's the thing is that now we're in a... We're in a, in a we've hit a time within our ACOs where rainbow tick accreditation is starting to become a hot topic... Um, family violence and the intersection of LGBTQIA plus communities is always a topic of conversation. But even in the areas of, you know, our kids in out-of-home care um, and in other spaces, how are those queer kids? How are they coping with being um, going through a system that can often weaponise their racial identity and ignore their queer identity. Like That's a space where I think it's really... We need to start kind of having more conversations and um, creating more visibility because um, we know that we're at a time now where, you know, the older ones are going to start moving on and the younger ones are going to start coming up. Okay, so that brings us to the end of today. But before we go, I was wondering if I could just ask one more question about any words or words of advice or messages for any young mob, young intersectional mob that are out there that might be feeling um, invisible or isolated um, or just looking for more support within community. Just that they're not alone and that if they haven't found their people yet, they will, and they'll find people who accept them wholly and unconditionally. My advice would be to trust yourself, yeah, um, and don't sec- don't let other people influence you, make you second guess that maybe you're this isn't who you are or this is who you want to be. Um, and it sounds very cliche, but just hang in there. Sometimes you've got to, you know, for a very long time in my life I pick and chose when I internalise certain things only because it you got to pick your moments and pick your battles and it'll get better. I've just hit 30 and I can tell you it gets better and I wish you all the best. Yeah, mine's the same as Harold. Just trust the process. Those that love and care for you will be there and those that see you will see you and embrace you. So you've got to trust the process. Nice. Lovely words of wisdom there from our panellists today. Thanks, everyone, um, for joining. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you and see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.